In a minute, I'm going to reveal to you the number one question I am asked whenever I give lectures on in utero brain development for parents. I'm a developmental molecular biologist by training. Most of my life has been spent primarily as a private consultant, mostly to biotech and pharmaceutical industries. My specialty is the genetics of psychiatric disorders, so I'm very interested in what happens when brains develop in a womb at the level of gene and cell, and then when things screw up and you can get a behavioral disorder. So I spent a long time thinking about the distance between a gene and a behavior, primarily as a glorified troubleshooter. I founded two brain research institutes along the way, and in one in particular, uh, I would, uh, because we would uh, investigate how infants process information at cellular, molecular, and behavioral levels, that's where sometimes I would give talks about in utero brain development to parents, actually the parents-to-be. This book comes from a mistake I would make whenever I would introduce those audiences and talk to them about brain development, because I'd always start out, you guys, by saying something like, behold, the differential gene transcription in the developing raw encephalon. Take a look at neuronal growth cone migration and here are some cells and tasty molecules. And I would watch my audiences just kind of fade away from me and I could see a strong distance beginning to come and then at the very end I could see how far I had missed my audiences simply by the questions I would be asked by these parents, primarily parents to be, they had just found out they were pregnant, uh, 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 at the end of the talk. Uh, quite literally, I would get the same five questions over and over again. Questions like, so, how do I get my kid into Harvard? <laughs> well, there's nothing wrong with Stanford or Berkeley, and there's nothing wrong with the University of Washington, so I think what they're really asking is, how is it I get my kid to survive a tough intellectual environment given a knowledge-based economy? I would get questions like, does my kid have an active mental life in the womb? How do I make a happy child? What is having a baby going to do with my primary relationship, primarily a marriage? What's the baby's, having a baby going to do to my marriage? And the heartbreaker question of all, almost always delivered by a grandmother who'd gotten custodial uh, 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 authority over her grandchild because the daughter was a crack addict. Dr. Medina, how do I make a moral child? That unexpected nature sort of reminds me of something that is very much in the heart and soul of brain rules for baby, and that is the unexpected nature of what parenting looks like and brain development looks like. And that reminds me of a very interesting story about a uh, clinical pediatrician who has a four-year-old daughter, uh, and the four-year-old daughter was in the back seat of a car, good, strapped into a car seat, and she's a pediatrician on the clinical faculty of a medical school. She's driving, stopped at a light, she's left her stethoscope in the back seat of the car, and as she stopped at the light, she looks and sees the little girl's hand kind of moving over to the stethoscope and grabbing it. And the mother is going, oh, be still, my beating heart. We're going to have another pediatrician in the household. And she sees the little girl actually grab the stethoscope and put it between her ears just like she should. And now the mom is going, oh, we're only 12 years in an MCAT away from having a real live physician in the household. And she gets quickly disabused of the attitude when the little girl grabs the bell of the stethoscope, puts it to her lips and shouts, welcome to McDonald's. <laughs> May I take your order, please? So I wrote the book Brain Rules for Baby in an attempt to address some of this unexpectedness and I decided to take my audiences seriously. I was given an ivory tower, they were asking for ivory soap. So the ivory soap questions look like this and it produces the organization of the book. There's an introduction, pregnancy considerations, relationship considerations, uh, smart, happy, moral, and the questions that, were, that the book is organized around follow the same types of questions I always got whenever I saw that my audiences really weren't interested in the rhombencephalin. So number one, does my baby have an active mental life in the womb? How will bringing this infant home affect my marriage? How do I get my kid into Harvard? How do I raise a happy child? How do I raise a moral child? And the number one question I get whenever it is that I am talking with audiences, particularly college educated audiences and particularly technical sophisticated audiences with uh, uh, lots of advanced degrees in the room, is that guy. How do I get my kid into Harvard? How do I create an intellectual environment at home that will allow them to be intellectually successful later on in life? And so I'm going to talk about that for the next 45, 50 minutes or so. And I'm going to divide this lecture into an introduction and three parts in order to be able to talk to you about it. So.